assumption that we're able to collect all the information on the fly as it's happening, uh, sort of a currency type of question. Uh, most marketers I know are not that ready to sit and wait for results to come in. They're ready with their next idea and they're going to be swapping things out. And of course, across silos, everybody's doing all of that. So you're getting a lot of movement, so not just specific to a channel, but messages, communications, campaigns within each of these. So is it really, is, it, is there a, you know, a baseline approach to this that allows us to work around? the you know, real-time reality that's out there so that we're really looking forward to setting budgets correctly next year, uh, given all of that movement in the, in the data that you're basing this on? Well, I mean, yeah, let's face it, marketing programs and budgets evolve constantly, right? Which is part of the reason you're never done with this work, is you have to recalibrate solutions to be reflective of how the company is going to market in a particular campaign. So it's it's very much an iterative process. But once you have it set up, it's not a big effort to recalibrate the solution to make sure again it's reflective of the mix of marketing that's being used, so that you do have that informed basis for you know making the overall spend decisions as well as what's going to be the allocation of spend across all these different direct marketing tactics. So, no silver bullets there, I don't think, if that answers your question. I mean, I do think there's a level of sophistication that we are approaching, and, and somewhere along that line, human beings are not going to have the ability to keep all of those pieces and data points set. You know, we talk about this this uh, marketing mix modeling and, and the, the one ring to rule them all. It's possible that technology can help us to comprehend that, but at some point we'll find the, the right point where my people are able to contribute strategy and the tools are able to help them do it. Yeah. Question here? Uh, so, I, I, think, I think it's unfair to ask the three of you to define this. I, I think it's kind of crazy and I think just by bringing up a lot of you from fantasy and <laughs> uh, that, that being said, I think we have evolved the definition to the negotiation between advertising suppliers and brands or marketing teams and the head of marketing to an acceptable level of credit so that everyone keeps their job or gets paid something. I think that is the definition. What I'd like to get from you, because I think this is something you could supply that we could all benefit from, are any recommendations that either your organizations have regarding case studies for attribution or any general case studies from management organizations that we could read that have studied attribution for more than one year. But they looked and said, okay, we've created this attribution model, we've now weighed budget to shift based on that, we've surveyed it, we've done it for one year, now we've done it another year. Are there any studies like that to your knowledge that we might all benefit from that we can access? I think, Scott, one of the key words here is access. Like, I think we probably can all think of personal success stories within our own organizations where we kind of, you know, internally we see, all right, these are results year over year. But in a lot of cases, well, in all cases that I'm familiar with, the marketers aren't willing to share that publicly, whereby it can be studying a case study. Like I can think of personally stories that I know of where marketers done X, Y, and Z with some divisions within Converse, and it's been incredibly successful. It's been measured in a, in a very rigid manner, and they continue to invest in it, continue to reap rewards from it. But in terms of like something that's readily accessible, they're usually not willing to share, at least in, in my personal experience. Fair. And I would further caution that most of the case studies, and I'll lump myself in with this, are really going to be sales pieces. I mean, Absolutely. people are promoting proprietary solutions, and I think if you want to go to academic research on how to, to properly attribute marketing activity, you're probably going to be looking at a lot of material that's 40 years old, because this hasn't changed. It's just how do we apply it. Okay. And I think also part of the reason you're not going to find case studies out there is, to the earlier point, in my opinion, very few organizations have successfully tackled multi-channel attribution. Now where you well find case studies, and this is a, another topic really that fits in, is media mix modeling, which is very conceptually very similar to multi-channel attribution. I mean, they're similar in that both are designed to help organizations figure out what is the relative effectiveness of the different marketing activities so I can not only set overall budget levels intelligently, but figure out how to allocate dollars. Media mix modeling has been around forever uh, because it answers the macro question, right? It's looking at, for a company overall, if I look at all their online and offline channels and I look at their overall sales, I can build econometric models to tell me what is the relative contribution 
of those various online and offline channels while controlling for other environmental factors that would impact sales. So that, that business has been around for decades, right? There's case studies out there to show that, and that's been very successful. But multi-channel attribution, on the other hand, is newer, and it's really more designed to answer the micro question of, for a given direct marketing program, at an individual level, how do I determine what is the relative effectiveness of the very granular marketing communications I'm using through these addressable channels in terms of driving the business outcomes I'm seeking to drive, which is typically sales. I just think very few companies have really gotten to the point where they would have a, a real compelling case study to tell. And if they did, they wouldn't, you know, to the earlier points, they wouldn't be willing to share it. Mm -hmm. So with a holdout group or a control group, um, considering multi-channel questions, if I'm using two or three addressable media, like say I'm doing direct mail with email follow-up and mail, or maybe outbound phone follow-up, do I have, don't I get crazy with control groups? Yes. So, and. so I would have a control group for the people who got no direct mail. Another one for the ones who got no telemarketing. The ones that got no email. Then the ones that got one but not the other. And, crazy, so like, yes, but measurable. Yeah. Right? You can go crazy trying to measure something that isn't measurable. Yeah. So, the, so how do you advise your clients if they don't have enough volume to support that kind of granularity? Or, I, I get the concept, but I think realistically you have to be like a multi-million piece mailer to to set up panels like that. You're right. I mean, and what, what we try to do is limit the scope of measurement. Yeah. It's a signal to noise ratio. If I can talk to, to you know, a tenth of a percent, whatever I do is going to disappear inside of that entire audience. If I can narrow that down and, and limit both the people I talk to and the way that I measure them, and I don't know how to give you better examples of that other than that, that is our challenge, is how do I, how do I test that when a test by definition is a drop in the bucket? Um, so I have to limit the scope of my measurement so that I can get directional data so that I can go bigger and then increase the scope of measurement as well. Ruth, I, I would offer this perspective. It sometimes feels, this can feel like a circular reference. So, um, you know, I've got, I want to do all nine holdout cells that, that you just described and it can get crazy and i got to watch this thing for 18 months and oh man, so then, so then that kind of says, that kind of leads you to say, well, let me just look in the past and see what I can learn just from the past instead of taking 18 months to do this. And you learn these things from the past and you do some modeling or whatever, and it leads you to hypotheses that you then have to go out and test. And so you're kind of back where you started. There's a circular reference to this, look back, create a hypothesis, test forward, read, look back. So anyway, I wanted to share that with your question. Thanks. Um, there's a lot of, well, I've seen a lot of activity from, uh, I guess, DMPs and various data companies that are trying to unify identities across device IDs and home addresses and email addresses and maybe social identities kind of building out all these new ways to reach people and ultimately that's used for this multi-channel marketing. Is that, is that kind of data making attribution more challenging or, or easier? The fact that there's companies now that can... I think it's giving you an opportunity to measure things that you've never been able to measure before and in a lot of cases, you know, how does your offline activity have an impact when a lot of the sales are taking place online. So I, I get mailers from Brooks Brothers, but I, I don't ever go into a Brooks Brothers store, I usually buy online. It's not like a special code thing we're having to sell right now. So now because you've connected the dots between offline addressable and online, you can say, hey, you know what, I sent this group a piece of direct mail, direct mail piece, and I also messaged them online, and I went through and I saw that they completed a sale, or I just sent them a direct mail piece, this is what happened, or I just messaged them online, this is what happened. So you now have the ability to at least compare some groups that you've never been able to compare before. So it's it's kind of like a step up from where you were before. So I think it's you know a good move in the right direction. So it's making it somewhat easier. Yeah. Somewhat, somewhat easier, easier but more, com more complex. Though. Yeah. Uh, it's a great question, because to me, one of the most salient use cases of a, of a DMP is to help facilitate the creation of a multi-channel attribution solution. But ironically, I don't see a lot of organizations that are taking the DMP plunge, looking at it that way. It's more the ability to unify all this online offline data, including sales data from all channels, and then activate audiences online. Yes. They haven't, 
they're not really thinking about the attribution that that would enable. So I think it's a big missed opportunity. So it's a great question. It, it, and, and to build on, on John's point, I mean, you see addressable targeting, which we've had for several years, and we're just now hearing people start to talk about addressable measurement, which is, you know, the data that drove this, just like John just said, that all fed into it. And if I stop listening, and the DMP can't often help you there. You know, they might have found me on my phone and you were looking to talk to me, but uh, either they couldn't put a cookie on my phone or the cookie on my phone doesn't match the cookie on my desktop at work because that's where I order all my stuff. So um, being able to close that loop measurement-wise is almost a separate technology that builds addressable marketing. I actually have two questions. One, with your Now that we are more technology advanced, do you feel as if we're relying more on the data than actually seeing how people do react within the markets? <laughs> well, I think you, to me, you rely on the data to understand how people are acting. I mean, it's the way you measure consumer behavior. Have you ever had an instance where the information just didn't correct what you wanted to do? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I, I'll say we, we spent the last 20 years uh, online looking at things like clicks and saying, boy, I'd really like to pay some money to get somebody to click on my ad and show up on my website. And now we're starting to say, is that really the behavior I wanted to drive? And we're able to close that loop and take it all the way to dollars. And it's hard to argue with dollars. Um, now, I, I will, it's a bug. <laughs> coming right towards me. Uh, but, uh, you know, we talked before about do we bring in the CRM data? Yeah, absolutely. And part of that is being able to go all the way downstream and say, not only did I bring this person in, I sold to them. Now I've got CRM data. And three months from now, I can know that this person is a regular client and not a chargeback or a return or a one-time client. So I think we're getting a better ability to, to look at our, our ability to influence consumer behavior there certainly is more qualitative data that we can bring in. Um, but we are focused on the quantitative, you know, dollars are great, we, we like them. Hey, question here? I just wanted to add to that point, though, because remember that there are different cycles in the consumer's relationship with the company. So you may have some left customers or customers who just see it for the first time. You can't really know exactly where they're going to end up. But we can predict, we can try to do stuff. So not all of our customers are the same in, in terms of the data issues that we have to talk to. Um. All right, so I want to do a little bit of a lightning round here, you guys. So this is, this is a question for the group. So um, we'll start with you, James. What is the, so I'll we'll frame it this way, um, attribution or what clients try to do with that, even if it's not some big fancy media mix model or a whole multi-channel action, even if it's just single channel, last touch, last click, whatever. Campaign, measurement, analysis. What is the smartest decision you've seen a client make in this area? The smartest, and there probably isn't one smartest, but I think it's just being cognizant of the whole entire picture, not just looking at it in that silo that we keep talking about. So it's just understanding that it's not just this one campaign, or, or even just thinking that last last touch is the best. It's kind of just understanding that there's other things out there. So it's not. I can't think of like one shining example where somebody did this and it was like an aha moment, but I think um, you know, you're talking to advertising clients that are at least thinking about it, you know, that's, those are the smart decisions. That's, that's kind of that's what you look for and you're excited and you see you can have those conversations. Will, aha moments, smartest decision. I'm going to almost mirror that to say the recognition that an a attribution, an attributed conversion is not the same as an impression. It happened and measured it at the end. Being able to say last best touch, First best touch, are they different, why, and then what does that mean? That That is the road to a uh, proper attribution model. John, what do you think? Client story, smartest decision you've seen? Well, sadly, not a lot of smart decisions. Because <laughs> again, it gets back to the point earlier about companies are really, for the most part, just starting with this. And I guess the best decisions I've seen, just based on some personal experience, are just making some basic, but important and impactful decisions around shifting money from one channel to the other based on the attribution results and using that as a starting point to get more refined with how they then use the solution going forward. Okay? 
So we'll, we'll snake back the other way. This so we'll stay with you, John. What is the worst decision you've seen a marketer make <laughs> as a result of poor attribution or no attribution? What's the worst decision? Um, I think this came up earlier as well. It's it's weird for me to see this, but there is still a lot of double counting out there because most companies are still in kind of the traditional campaign measurement uh, mode of operation, and they will drop a campaign and then they'll look at the results, but if that campaign overlaps with another campaign yeah. and the results are in the, in the overlapping attribution windows, they will count the sale twice. <laughs> Still happens a lot. What do you think, Will? Worst decision? Worst decision was uh, you're fired because your data doesn't match up with my site analytics tool, which I absolutely believe in. Why can't anyone give me data that agrees with the one tool I've chosen to believe in? I guess I'll go hire and fire someone else next year. <laughs> what do you think, James? Share, share, a, share a worst decision. You know, worst decision. decision. I can get something that's a little bit more uh, high-ish. Uh, so I, I have the worst decision. I, I know there was a decision that was made about flawed data. And the, the decision maker knew that it was flawed, and they made the decision not anyways because of just certain just business pressures. That's probably thinking back on it without getting the details. It was a decision that was made based on flawed data where everybody knew it was flawed, but the decision was, was made in the So James, we'll stick with you and snake back this way. What is the, what is the most difficult channel to attribute credit back to? Again, you're talking like at an individual or like personal level, maybe like out of home or print, something to that effect? What do you think, well, hardest channel? I'm going to go with digital. It's my bread and butter, and because part of it's addressable and huge swaths of it are not, and because I have so much pressure to, to spend into all of that, it is always going to, to have challenges of, of direct marketing mixed with, with broadcast stuff. John, biggest, biggest challenge, hardest channel? Well, I think it's in general it's the uh, non-addressable channels, but I think particularly radio, because I think that tends to be a more elusive audience compared to the big TV. So that would be the worst culprit within the non-addressable <laughs> channels. <clears throat> okay. Well, so I think we wanted to kind of hit the home stretch here. So my last question for the group is, you know, you guys, each of you works in direct marketing, in analytics, across channels. <coughs> what, so let's talk about the attribution landscape and looking forward a year. What is missing right now from this, at and take this question wherever you'd like to take it. What is missing from the attribution landscape that you would like to see added in the next 12 months that would help either your organization or your clients or both? I'll start with you, James. What is missing that you would like to see? Something that's missing that I think we'll actually see within the next 12 months is better attribution across mobile channels. Mobile? Yeah, mobile. So if you think about it, you've got people that are buying audiences now versus making a mobile buy, a PC buy, a you know, tablet buy, they're really interested in reaching an audience, but a lot of times the measurement is on this happened on a smartphone, this happened on a tablet, it's pretty you know, robust in a PC environment, but being able to properly attribute digital credit across all these different channels and just focus on I'm trying to reach James, I'm trying to reach Will, and figuring out kind of how to attribute this credit back and having a system that tracks them all kind of like on the same playing field. I think that's something that would be fantastic to see. I, I think we will make huge advances within the, the next 12 months for getting better mobile attribution. What do you think, Will? Mm -hmm. What's missing that you would like to see added to help your organization or your clients work better? I think what we're missing are standards when we spent a decade trying to define an impression and a click and we will never define an attributable conversion. I know there are academics in the room. Um, if you find a way to, to have a standard model that is an attribution but still gives me an opportunity to innovate, have something proprietary and sell my product, that will go a long way to helping all of our uh, stakeholders, whoever they are. You'll pay for the study? <laughs> <laughs> well, then it'd be proprietary with my mom. <laughs> <laughs> what do you think, John? What's missing that you would like to see added? Well, you know, when I look at the commercially available attribution solutions that are out there, the, the gap that I continue to see, and this gets back to some of the earlier conversation, has to do with what I think of as unattributed revenue. And again, that's revenue uh, that results from the non addressable channels. Most of the solutions I see don't account for that, and by not accounting for that, they are by definition over crediting the direct or addressable channels. To me, that's a huge oversight. I'd like to see that change. Yeah. 
now. Rick. Question. In our January luncheon, Bruce Babel brought up trends in 2016, and one of them is it's coming this year, addressable TV. If you throw that into the mix now across what you all have talked about today, is this a hinder, a hurt? Where, where does that sit? Because now there's going to be more new, if you will. Uh, I'd to get your opinion on it. I think it's a great development. We're actually seeing a lot of clients interested in this, and we're actually developing some solutions at Epsilon. When you think about it, TV historically has been the single biggest advertising medium, right? But it's, un it's not addressable. Well, now, because they're losing market share, you know, TV's getting on board. They're like, we got to make this stuff more measurable because we're going to continue to lose money to digital marketing. So to me, this is a huge positive development as it relates to attribution because now, just like direct mail or email or all the other addressable channels, we can see who is targeted, when and with what message, combine it with all the other data we need, and understand what is the relative effectiveness of TV vis-a-vis -vis all these other channels. I think it's a, a great frontier. I think that's another opportunity for standards. I mean, I was doing addressable television trials six or eight years ago, and we had the Canoe Project, which basically started by saying the standard for addressable television is whatever any of our participants are doing now, plus whatever they want to do in the future. It makes it very, very hard to operate in that ecosystem. It's worse than digital. It's fragmented into not just addressable, non-addressable, but eight different types of, of MSO hardware. So there's a huge opportunity there. A lot of work still needs to be done. I also think it's positive. I think it's really interesting when you think about a company like Verizon, who has Fios, a TV provider. They power the phone in your pocket, and they also own AOL. 